Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's Launch Awesome AMA. I'm Steve. I run the Launch Awesome community here, and today I'm joined by Dave Schools, good friend of mine. Dave is the VP of Multi-Product Growth, a title you don't always hear. I'm so super excited to talk about that. At a company called Hopin, which we all know, and founded the, also founded the Entrepreneur's Handbook. It's a medium publication, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. So I think one of the, probably one of the most subscribed to publications on Medium. So pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Today, Dave and I are going to be talking about Hopin's journey going from a single product to having a suite of products in kind of the video events community space. Yeah. Very excited to get into all that. If this is your first time joining us, Launch Awesome is a Slack community for our product leaders to just connect and learn from each other and just help each other to build and launch great products. We've got like 500 of the best in product, product marketing, product ops, product ops and they're now. So if you'd like to join, Blake is going to drop a link in the chat and we'd love to have you. You couple of housekeeping things in the bottom right, you'll notice a Q&A little widget that you can submit some questions to. Hop in here. It's got a, a bunch of great little kind of features around just interacting. Any, you hear anything you like, just give the screen a couple clicks. You'll get some fun little kind of pop-ups and just kind of let us know what you're thinking. And all right, with that, let's get into it. Dave, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. I'm excited to chat with you, my man. Yeah, for sure. So for the people that don't know, give us the two minute highlight reel of your career, just so people know where you're coming from. Okay. Entrepreneurship is in my blood. That's the headline, maybe. Yeah. From New York originally, I studied and majored in entrepreneurship. That was my college degree. Did a couple of different jobs, mostly in marketing, and then was it in an agency in DC, design development agency, and quit that job. And I don't think I'll ever work at an agency again. Sorry if people work at agencies here, but I feel safe saying that, being in the, in the product community. A lot of in-house people, hopefully. But wrote a book, launched a, a medium publication, Entrepreneur's Hand. Yes. Did freelance uh, marketing and ghostwriting for tech CEOs and ran one of the first Hoppin events ever. And that's how I met Johnny Booferhat, founder and CEO of Hoppin. And I've been at Hoppin since September 2019. So going on four yep. years come September. Nice. Coming up on an eternity in tech career. I know. And so nice. Cool. Love that. Okay. This is a kind of, you know how to get into this one. So we're going to be talking about Hopin's move from single product in the event space to, you know, started a couple of products from the ground up, acquired a few. So we're going to be kind of talking about navigating this move to a suite of products. To set the scene, can you give us a little bit of like the history of Hopin? I think people kind of need to know, yeah, know a little bit of like what was going on beforehand, yep. kind of right up until that decision to kind of build and launch another product. Totally. Yeah. So Hopin started as a virtual events platform and what it really did that was different at the time in 2019 was combine a bunch of disparate separated features across the on event or experience, experiential platforms and put them all in one and making it into kind of a virtual venue experience with stage registration, stages, lobby, one-on-one -on -one networking, exhibitor booths. And, and different breakout sessions. We were clear to say we were not a webinar solution at the time because webinar kind of had, in 2019, this is pre-pandemic, pre like mm -hmm. the surge that the pandemic brought with it for digital experiences. Uh, so we said we weren't a webinar platform where we focused in on the human connection, like personal face-to-face -face connection that you can create meaningfully over video. And in mm -hmm. talking with Johnny, and running the first event as through Entrepreneur's Handbook as, as, a, as a publication, I wanted to bring my remote community together, mm -hmm. get, get folks in the same room, just talking, networking, connecting. And when we did that, it was the, A, the easiest, easiest event I'd ever run. And mm -hmm. people loved it. And it opened my eyes to the future of events, the future of community engagement, and even potentially like social networking at the time. Like I was just blown away by it. And that's what forced me to quit all the, all the income streams I was running as kind of like an indie solopreneur kind of hacker builder guy, writer, yeah, uh, and jump in with two feet with, with Johnny as employee number one. Yeah. Dang. I didn't know you're employee number one. So you've been there from the get go. Okay. So that's the beginning. Give it, give us like the, let's do like the cutscene version of, or the, what am I looking for? Montage version of, so that's the beginning. Give me like the quick version of everything that happens up until like Hey, the decision, Hey, we need to, we need to branch out. We see these up our opportunities. We're going to think about building other products. Like what, totally. what happens in the interim there? 
after joining, we found product market fit and that was November, December, we raised a pre-seed round and then the pandemic was cropping up. Right. And so that hit kind of full fledged February, 2020 is when we started yeah. to see the inbound to our website for virtual events, just skyrocket. I remember the early team, we had seven days a week, back to back demos all day long for people wanting to get access to, to our, our solution. Damn. And that, that kind of carried on through the summer. And then we, we went through a period of, of hyper growth. Like we raised close to a billion dollars in pretty much less than a year. Yeah. We scaled to hundreds and, and hundreds of employees. We were valued at 7.75 billion. All the, like the fortune 500 companies started using us. And also, and this is kind of answering your question about multi-product, we bought five companies. We acquired five yeah. other startups and that's okay. kind of. I guess different about Hoppin's story is being a two-year-old, like less than two-year-old startup yeah. buying five companies. You were those mostly, it. yeah, were those things that you mostly folded into, into the Hoppin like primary platform? It was not, not really. StreamYard we did. That, that was in the first integration because we were looking at the backstage experience and we said like, how do we make this the best it possibly can be? And our customers told us StreamYard was the best. And we bought StreamYard. You can, you can look it up. It's public for $250 million. And that turned out to be probably the best business move that we ever made uh, yeah. today, but we can get into that later. And then the other, the other products are, are of, of varying degrees of size and investment. Some of them stayed standalone. Some of them we integrated, some of them we shut down. So I guess when it comes to going multi-product, there's two ways, build or buy. And that yeah. comes down to your, your M&A strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me. Yeah. Talk to me more about the ones that stayed standalone and then, and like, how do they, how do they like function today? Yeah. Our, so integrating products, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a developer, but it's very difficult to combine code bases as we all know. And so the, the, the strategy that we have at Hoppin with our, the suite of products that we now are is that each product should be successful independently in its own vertical. So that we're not kind of using other products as a crutch uh, for the success of any new product that we launch. When it makes sense to, there's, there's obvious cross-sell opportunities and kind of the strategy that we use, like what's the bucket that our suite fits into? Right now, we would label it all as community and community experiences. That's everything. All the Hoppin products provide the best community experiences. And community is a huge category that we see nobody really leading, right? But HubSpot, Figma, Notion, like a lot of huge companies, Salesforce, yeah. are powered by amazing communities, but the tools there are missing. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Talk to me about, okay, May let's get into the details of like some of the stories of some of the early acquisitions. Like what was, I mean, you, you guys were kind of staring down this huge opportunity in front of you. What was going on that you were thinking strategically like, hey, we need what, like what, what made those interesting avenues for you guys to pursue? I think it was growth and diversity. Johnny is a fantastic, like business mind as a leader. And he, he was never, if I'm, if I'm honest, he was never really like an events only kind of person. Like he didn't come from the event planning space. Mm -hmm. He's like a video tech growth guy. Yeah. And so when, when we raised, you know, all this capital. And he was looking to grow as fast as possible. And that's been a key, that's been a key differentiator in, in Hoppin' success is speed is by acquiring customer bases, good products that we can build up and kind of revamp and then have this, this bundle strategy that we're still working on. It's definitely not, you know, over. We're not as tightly integrated as like G Suite, for example, or the Creative Cloud or Atlassian. Like everybody does it different, but that's kind of what we're headed to. And it's, it's, it's a, the ability to basically make a bigger impact than if we had just stayed in the events vertical. Yeah. Okay. So stream, stream art was the first one. Is that right? The, there was the streamable stream yard, a 10 to five boom set. And, uh, there was another one that was smaller vectorly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I clearly didn't oh, do much. And Topi, Topi was one too. Okay. Gotcha. Maybe let's pick like, I don't know, what's one that stands out the most to you in your mind is like, well, streamer today is, is, is the, the bulk of our business. Now after the, the pandemic has kind of faded, the demand for virtual event solution has us as well. 
but StreamYard did such an amazing job. And we could talk about this from like a go to market or like a product perspective, like sales led versus self serve. StreamYard did a fantastic job going after the creator economy and pressing into more of a PLG self serve bottoms up approach where Hop and scaled to enterprise, the top, the upside of the market very yeah. quickly. And now we're, that's kind of like where our, this, our sales led muscle is. And StreamYard has that self serve muscle. Yeah. So kind of coming, coming at each other. And that's where there's, it's additive in what you learn from the companies that you, you buy and the products you buy. Gotcha. Okay. Was the StreamYard more of like, a, hey, this is just like an opportunistic, our customers are telling us they like certain things about it? Or what, what was kind of like the driving, driving force behind wanting to get that? Yeah, a couple of things. A, customers wanted it and they were using it already because Hopin accepted RTMP streaming in and they were using StreamYard to do that anyways. Mm -hmm. So we were sitting, you know, we thought we might, might as well make a, a native integration. And I remember Johnny pulling it internally the company and saying, if we were to, to acquire a software to power the backstage of Hopin events, what would it be? Everybody said StreamYard. Okay. Then Johnny developed a relationship with, with Gage and Dan, the, the co-founders of StreamYard. And they're, they're a master class on how to be builders of, of high, high growth SaaS companies. They're, they're based in, in Texas now, but bringing kind of what they learn and their approach. If I were to say one thing that the acquisition of StreamYard, other than the success as a business unit has brought to happen, it's the learnings from how that team approaches. It's uh, how they treat customers, community marketing mm -hmm. has kind of been adopted across the rest of the business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, would you would you say it was like more at the time, like thinking about it more as a way to like plug like a shortcoming in the hop in platform at the time? Like like were you more interested at that time at least in the the tech around it or the the customer base? Yeah, for sure. It was definitely to solve the the hop in backstage at that time was was a little decrepit, I guess. Not not the best solution. And StreamYard was, was, was far better from a production and ease of use standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think that there was also kind of, they, they were specializing in live streaming at the time. They do a lot more today. So the, the opportunity to bring hop and events to the enterprise users who were, who were customers of, of StreamYard, there was also that, that capability as well. Got it. So just like, almost like a, Hey, you guys are already using this. You guys are already using StreamYard. You can use hop and the two can play nicely. So it's kind of like a. You know, you, yeah. way to win more sales or whatever. I said the other one, the strategy that there are one of the, the, the key pieces of the streamer acquisition was to also to let them keep building as they were and not really disturb or force anything upon them because they had all, they had gotten offers from other companies to get bought based on, on how fast they grew. It was the two guys and they grew to, grew to $12 million ARR, just mm -hmm. two, just two guys hacking. <laughs> Uh, so they're getting approached, but one of Johnny's promises to, to Gage and Dan was that we're not going to, you know, there'll be no force rebrand. You won't have to do X, Y, Z, you know, be, be, you know, join our corporation kind of, they were enabled to stay independent and that's largely contributed to their success. I'd say today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's super interesting. Okay. Let, let's move up to, so we talked a little bit about some of the things you guys have acquired. Talk to me more. I guess about the session story and like the idea to, to kind of go out and build like a net new product. Like what, what was going on for the company that you guys were thinking, Hey, this is like the right, the right strategy for us to pursue right now. Yep. So let me, I'll paint the picture and then answer your question with session. There's, so we have two products that we're building kind of from the ground up mm -hmm. and then two that we bought that are still in market StreamYard, obviously, and then streamable. It's mm -hmm. super easy to use video hosting platform. It's kind of like YouTube without the social social network side of things that's got that gets a billion views a year views a year it's kind of this underground how people share video almost like vimeo but for creators that's streamable and that's still in market with a small team session and project c are two products that we're building from the ground sessions in market it began initial rollout a couple months ago and is, is seeing some good traction today. And Project C isn't out yet, but we have a wait list and it's launching later this year. So maybe we could talk about that one as well if, if we want without disclosing too many details. Oh, with, yeah. with Session, that one we, we've built from, from the ground up, basically because we heard from customers that Hopin Events, while it's an amazing tool, highly rated, like top virtual events 
conference solution. It's a, it's a big platform. It's robust. It's, it takes work to, to set it up and instrument it because everything is essentially customizable and people mm -hmm. hire like full blown agencies to run their annual events for it. So we want, yeah, there's both a, a gap in the product and in the business model of hopping events that we wanted to fix with session yes. in the product. It was, it's how complicated and how robust hopping events became. But in the yeah. business model, it was the recurring usage of Hopin. It was basically being used for the largest events on the web by enterprises. And that, they happened like once a year. Right. So, so the churn became a problem. And we wanted something that people would use on a weekly or even daily basis. Yes. And that's where session is kind of the, we, we describe it as lightweight, fun, and super interactive. Yes. It's like, it's main to, like bringing that level of engagement that Hopin events had, but putting it into a fun, like easier tool that you can use for large meetings, workshops, training, employee engagement, and stuff like this, like for community, super yes. brandable. It's like lightweight hopping events. That's kind of what you could call session. Right. Yeah. One of the questions I was wanting to get to later was around like, should your second product sell to the same audience? It sounds like kind of what you're saying is your bread and butter at the time hopping was just was more geared towards those enterprise clients and did a got good job serving them well. But for you, maybe a lot of these smaller players, not smaller players, but like people that weren't necessarily hosting this giant, you know, thousands of people event wanted something a little bit more lightweight. So it's almost like a similar, it's like a similar product just for a fully different set of users as yeah. opposed to like a different product for the same. User. There's overlap for sure, but it was interesting when we, yeah. when we first started rolling session out to the Hopin base, customer base, mm -hmm. folks were saying, great, but I don't need it. Like I want Hopin events. We were, the thought, are we had a hypothesis that we can move Hopin events customers over to session and they'll be happier over there if we had an enterprise mm -hmm. plan on session. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the case. They wanted all the bells and whistles and robust feature set customization of Hopin events. And so it's turning out that session is, is kind of filling this whole that this this gap in the market for something where it's zoom but more engaging and right. more more branding and more interaction and yes. more data as well right and it's kind of like that large but we don't want to go into the meetings like cl collaboration productivity meetings segment right. where we're competing with like slack huddle or right. like zoom teams yeah Google. those are those are fine solutions but once right. you start adding more and more people, like 30 plus people, like 30 to 100 people, yeah, maybe a little too small for Hopwood events or like a massive live stream, yeah. but something like session where you still want it to be interactive, participatory, right? that's where set, that's session mm -hmm. suite right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That kind of like middle ground kind of underserved segment of the market. Yeah. Where Zoom's not it, but Hopwood events is, is way too much. That kind of fits right in the middle. Yeah, that's interesting. Cool. Okay. Talk to me about like the research and insights, like programs, the things that you were doing that helped you kind of get that. Yeah. That helped you come to that decision that like, Hey, it actually makes sense for us to build a separate product for these people. Yeah. Talking to customers is the number one, the number one thing that we, that we did. And, and you, we, you do that by opening up a wait list and you see what kind of people and throwing up a landing page on your website and having some people talk about it, like customer success, talk to, talk to folks about their about this new product that's coming. And this is almost like pre beta, like as like customers aren't on the platform at all, but yeah. you want to start having those conversations so you can hear their pain points and make sure that, that you're building something that they want. And also at the same time, so I'd say talk to customers. Second one is study the marketplace, analyze how people are pricing and charging for their product mm -hmm. so that you know, kind of what your, your ICP is to go after. Yeah. yeah. There's a, and also just a, like a one, one, I forget who said this, but if there's nobody in the market, that's not necessarily a good thing. If there's competition in the market, that may be a good sign because there's a market there and people are spending money. There's businesses like there's a Bible and you can come in and do it better and do it faster. Mm -hmm. So if nobody's, nobody's building it, like take pause and do a little more research. But if there yes. are competitors, that's kind of validating that the market is there. And the question yeah. is, how big is the market? Yeah. Even kind of before that, when you're kind of like lightly committed to, you know, you're, 
customer success people are talking about it. Maybe you have a waitlist page. How did you guys think about and like how did you guys even evaluate? It's like even evaluate the opportunity of like, is this is this like a good use of resources to explore at all? Like what what was that discussion? Yeah, it's if there's traction. So what the product market fit is the North Star. That's how you know when to invest and kind of put a lot of resources and a bigger team behind a product. And we've called these smaller, so StreamYard, Hop and Events are kind of our two big businesses right now. Mm -hmm. Strip Session, Project C, and Streamable are, we call them our emerging business units or our bets. Mm -hmm. And as they gain traction, they're still kind of sorting out product market fit. Streamable and Session are different because Streamable has millions of users mm -hmm. it's just there it's just a lightweight product that needs needs some some product muscle behind it and, and a new and some new pricing plans session is still kind of pre-product market fit but we have some hypotheses and we're i think in the next three months we're going to start to see the the beginning of the hockey curve um but that's where instead of throwing hundreds of thousands of marketing spend or millions of marketing spend mm -hmm. towards a product that's in pre-product market fit you're going to waste a lot of money. That's going to be a lot of useless, useless data. If you yeah. can talk to your customers and find something where organically, like almost as it like with a bootstrapped sort of marketing spend, find that it works and then have that confidence, that retention and your growth loops in place. That's when you can start putting large marketing spend behind it with confidence in a way where, you know, it will, will, will resonate in the market. So we're, we're just about there with, with session with project C that's where we're also talking to community builders. Project C fits in because you have these kind of experiences, like video-based experiences with StreamYard, Hop and Events, Session, and Streamable, but where they all live in between those experience, experiences, mm -hmm. that's where we see an opportunity for a community platform that keeps it the, the kind of like a continuum between the products that Hop is, is building. Mm -hmm. And you have big players like Slack, Facebook groups, Discord, and, and Circle, and others. But all of them have their their issues and that's kind of like you combine what you're hearing from your customers this is where the opportunity is you combine what you hear from your customers with what you see in the market and then that's where you see gaps and you can innovate in those gaps and do something that people will talk about yeah that, that's how you grow organically okay yeah so at the very at the very beginning it's it's really just it's talking to customers hearing opportunities hearing ways your current products are not serving them well, hearing ways that other products in the market aren't serving them well, looking and seeing what's out there. And then, and then someone, were, are you, were you, were you the person like raising their hand saying like, Hey, here's what I'm here. Here's what I'm hearing. Here's what I'm seeing. I think there's an opportunity for this. I want, I want resources. I want a small team. I want to like go after that. Like how do, how do you go from, Session isn't a thing at the company at all to we're going to, we're going to actually explore this a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. From, from hearing with, for, from customers, this, the solution that they're looking for, I mean, like frustration with zoom is a, is a, is an obvious problem that I think a lot of people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And we're just at the cusp of video conferencing innovation. There's a whole space around engagement that we feel is, is, is not being met. And it starts with, with a hypothesis, a product hypothesis. And then you go out and you test that with the customer voice, with data, as much as you can surveys and, and you analyze the marketplace. And then you take, you take baby steps. And as long as you keep getting the green through, through these, these kind of loops of hypotheses, then you, you keep, there's minor pivoting, I'd say. And a lot of it is a dance between product and go to market, like how you message and position mm. the product versus what the product is. Messaging and positioning can move a lot faster than product. Like you can test messaging and positioning faster. Yeah. Just throw it in a deck, put it on a landing page, like send a link out, do an email and, and like measure conversion rates and click through rates and see what, what resonates the most. And then product can look at that and then decide how to prioritize roadmap items. Yes. Based on what they're seeing and, and what kind of the urgency behind and the data behind what, what customers are looking for. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You can, <laughs> you can say your one thing a lot faster. You're probably going to pay for that a little bit in like, if the product doesn't fulfill that promise, conversion rate will be shit or whatever. But 
you got the thing that matters, which is insight that, oh, people really want that. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people are signing up. A lot of people are you know, kind of whatever. There's a lot of interest there. Yep. That's really interesting. Okay. And there's, there's kind of like the overall brand. So we're talking about multi-product and building other products. If you have a brand that's known for a certain way of innovating and building, like releasing, Poppin was known for releasing features quickly. Customers would say, I got this event. And they're very stressed out because it's an event and mm -hmm. 20,000 people are coming. They need XYZ feature that's by then. We were, we shifted and moved super fast to make sure that they had it by, for their event. Yeah. So when we release new products, people sign up for them and say like, oh, like Poppin, Poppin is always building and, and, and innovating and, and launching new features for their products. So I'm here for it. Like, I want to see what this is. We had somebody say that about Session the other day, like Session is perfect. So like when Hoppin, who did StreamYard and Hoppin events, moves into workshops and, and larger meetings, they want to see it and they love it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. I spent way too long on this thread. Got a hundred other questions. Okay. Talk to me about what is the right structure for a team when you start to work on a new product? Like how many people, what are the rules? What are the goals like in the first, you know, first few weeks, months? Yeah. Super small. Be very like two engineers, a designer, a PM. That's it. And maybe some, maybe some GTM person to kind of give like the customer facing route, some, some grease PM should be talking with customers, like customer interviews as much as possible. Designers in Figma, just sketching out features. And then based, I think on a, the, the, the kind of gut hypothesis or the big vision combined with what you're hearing from customers, that's going to tell you what engineers should build. Yes. For prioritize. First session. How much were you doing even before like writing code? Like how much were you doing mock-ups, prototypes, testing? Like what did that, what did that look like? Well, Session came from an acquisition of Jam. Jam was a previous meeting product, kind of like a virtual workspace where you could like leave Slack and basically get on video and work with other people. And a lot of that ethos has come through to Session as well. The lightweight, mm -hmm. fun, fun side of, of, of using Session. So there's, there's a, a well-organized team ready to, to, to launch session. So it's kind of just rebranding and then building it. There was, it started as that, as jam. Then we gravitated more towards webinar and then StreamYard launches StreamYard on air, which is also a webinar solution. So now session is kind of evolving and to fit in the hop and suite and yes. meet another, like other, like internal segments within the webinar space. For example, StreamYard does it can go up to 100,000 people. You can embed that live stream. You use the StreamYard Studio. Live streams have that broadcasting delay a little bit. We're working on, on minimizing it, but it's up to 11 seconds between speaking and what people hear. With session, it's immediate and real time. So it's good for participatory interaction, like super. Anybody could like put in chat, I'd see it instantly. Like James, if you're in chat, or Teddy, if you're in chat, if you guys put something in chat, I see it. It's like a meeting, you know, like it's immediate. Uh, mm -hmm. interaction yeah that's something like this Blake says like this and we can pull <laughs> it on stage you know and like we do emojis and like we can interact with it woohoo James says right this is the kind of how a session is different from StreamYard but it's always the fun this is kind of my role at Hoppin is with all the the features the products that we launch how it fits together and how you tell a cohesive brand narrative is always fun and changing it's uh, it's never done because we keep yeah. building yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it sounds like you guys have to think a lot about just segments of the market and how the different products kind of fit into that. I think a lot of, I'm trying to think, I think a lot of companies like try and hit all of those things with one product with, you know, a bunch of different options and bells and whistles or add-ons, but you get, it seems like you guys have taken more of the like, oh, we have kind of like separate branded products for each one, which is really interesting. Super early on when you're building, maybe like for Project C, Talk to me about how do you keep the rest of the company like involved in the creation of the new pro product? Like how much are you communicating like success with them? Like how involved is the rest of the company? And yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a fine balance between not getting too many cooks in a kitchen mm -hmm. and causing bloat mm -hmm. while also keeping people believers, like believing in the product and that, you yeah. know, getting people excited for it. Um, so I think there, there's a balance. If you keep the team small intentionally, like don't just put headcount 
on a on an emerging product, like deliberately try to keep the team small and focused so they can move quick. Once they find it and the, the, that traction is starting to hit, for example, with with session, we're just we're kind of at the trajectory where week after week gets up and to the right on our core metrics. And then retention is also there and, and churn is low, sub sub eight percent. Um, that's where we're going to start investing in it more, both from a marketing spend point and GTM and, and kind of and, and engineers to keep up with the, the, the higher volume of customer requests coming in. But yeah, like you, you keep so Project C gives updates at our all hands and like shows people the development that's happening. Like it is accessible right now in like a private domain and we have the company on it for feedback. That's the other kind of may, why you should share it with the rest of the company and be pretty visible about stealth products to the rest of the company is for mindshare. Like you get everybody thinking about it, everybody using it. Maybe they have their own like side community. They can use it for it. And then you have like an early beta user with a trusted employee yeah. to get feedback. So I think the more minds and feedback you can get, the, the sharper the, the product can be. And then it comes down to the PM to be able to handle that kind of feedback from, from the rest of the company. Right. Any like rules of thumb around for something like Project C that's still building? Like what's like, what's like the right cadence of times you should be taking up time at an all hands to, to update the rest of the company? So Project C is a community product. Hopin is the community experiences, like a suite of community experience products. Because it's so core to who we are, we do talk about it a lot. For better or for worse, I think Shane, the PM, probably would hope that we talked about it less. Like, at this stage, <laughs> yeah. but everybody's super excited for it. And it's kind of a foray into a new space for Hopin, which is kind of not a video first and something right. that async and always, always on, you know, not like a live where you go live with a video kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I said monthly, at least like I said, I'm, I'm of the mind that, especially if you're in a remote company, more communication about it is better just so that nobody's caught off guard and people stay kind of excited yep. and there's momentum built yeah. yeah pre-launch and pre-beta users like how do you measure how do you even measure success or sh should you even measure success in any way yeah it's kind tough of it's tough to, to measure success when it's not in market I'd, I'd probably keep that over on the technical side for how like how often they ship new features like speed of, of, of how fast they build but once that's where i'd say to anyone who's who's looking to build a new product is one of the most important levers in getting a product to market in a way that de-risks launch is a wait list. And that's surprising, but having a wait list and then early act, then beta, then early access, then launch, like you have kind of these phases of a stealth product where it comes out, but it, and that way you get four launches instead of one, because mm -hmm. you want to avoid that blip up and down moment. You, you want to stretch it out as much as possible. And as you like, the, and the, so how do you measure success? How fast is that wait list growing? Are people talking about it? Yeah. That's like this, the, the number of folks on your wait list, if that keeps increasing and that can hockey stick, that's a good sign that people are excited about what you're building. Mm -hmm. What's the key to running like a good wait list for a product that you're working on? Yeah. A mystery. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'll take a little controversial approach here, but like, you don't want to just say like, here's exactly what it is and what it does. People see that and they say either, oh, that's great. Or like, okay, cool. And, but then like 75% per, of people on that wait list will be like, oh, that's not what I need. That's not, that's not what I was looking for. Where if you start with more general kind of messaging, positioning and design, you're casting a broader net. And then as the product develops, it's probably going to, to, increase in the number of folks on the wait list who it will appeal to depending if you're going for a super niche like vertical focused product or if you're building horizontally and to be honest hopin's product ethos is largely products that are horizontal where they span span verticals yes that makes sense okay okay good tips there well i want to get to q a i got a couple more let me see real quick uh, okay. Okay. One last one before we get to Q and A. Talk to me about like when you're ready to start having some like handpicked users for, I don't know, alpha or beta. Like, how do you start slowly letting people in? And like, what are what are those early? We got a we got a couple users. Like, 
what does that part of the process look like? Yeah. You? Entrepreneur hat on or intrapreneur hat on when we, what, so we set up our wait list there at Slack pings every time somebody fills out the form. We are all watching that channel and we will follow the domain of the email address, find them on LinkedIn, find them on socials, look at their website, have a little discussion like in thread about these waitlist signups that are coming. And then if there's excitement, if there's a good fit, it's like, yeah, exactly. Like this is the, the creator SMB profile that we're looking to, to go after. We reach out mm -hmm. and that's where, that's where I'd say like doing things that don't scale is okay for like the very, very early stages of a new product. Because you want like that feedback to be as human deep and like gut level, like where it hits people, convicts people like to, to believe in the product. That's where you need that, that sort of unsystematized touch, if you will. Yeah. Anything else special you're doing like for them, with them in that period? Customers on the wait, on the wait list? There's just people that are, that you're working with in your alpha and beta versions. We do town halls. All the folks, I mean, your a waitlist is essentially your community, like your early community. As yeah. you let people in, the folks who are most excited, that's, those are your raving fans. Like, and you want to build pricing for them. So you get pricing feedback Yeah. and you, you hold town halls and bring them together, show, show them what's been built and what you are building and then how to use it, like educate them. So that kind of early, early customer interaction, I'd say, I'd say it's just as important as building what they want. Yeah. Any like almost like gating around like moving from one phase to the next like do you need to hit some satisfaction milestone with like the set of users before opening up to like a bigger tranche i'd say i mean it comes down to to re retention right if people keep using the product then you get an idea for who it's a, it's a good fit for and then you, you can adjust your your messaging and positioning based on on that like community events is a big one for session we see that that kind of resonating in the market mm -hmm. you guys are, are are one of them for sure yes but like there's so many slack communities there's so many communities out there like the email lists one of the best ways to do community engagement is to bring people together and talk with them and like bring them up on stage and, and interact with them like have live moments together in person and, and but like mixers and networking there's so many slack community communities that are, are dying because they don't come together. Like it's not that strong a bond. Yes. Yeah. So that's where a product like, like session can, can help revive that. And it doesn't right. feel like work as much as a zoom call. Right. For sure. Okay, cool. All great. great info. Great intel. Okay. Could talk about this all day, but want to be cognizant of time. Going to jump into some questions from the audience. Blake's going to put some up there. I'll read them out and then you can take a crack at it. Would you choose to build PLG self-serve first and move into enterprise, or would you choose to build enterprise and then move into PLG self-serve? 1,000% PLG self-serve. No question. Easy. Tell me more. The reason is because with enterprise, you're whale hunting, and if a whale leaves, churns, and goes away, suddenly your balance sheet is affected in a big way, and that's a volatile, unstable, risky business to run. But if you have a, this like massive army of PLG self-serve and then one of them churns, that's not a big deal. Like you'll get three more from people using the product. And PLG is a lot harder, I'd say, but you know, people who are budget sensitive, don't want to talk to, to sales. And then th like finding the, the virality and the network effects built into your product is a lot harder, way more challenging. But if you can do it, you can build a, a, a very stable, scalable product. And then you can always move up market. You can always, you can always add enterprise, but don't do it too quickly. That's kind of the, the lesson, mostly from StreamYard. StreamYard built this amazing business that is mostly from the self-serve side of, of the market. And because like the, with the raving fans, it's community powered, they have PLG. People talk about it, has high reviews. Like there's so many benefits to getting right and treating right customers on a, on a self-serve plan because when you start also on the the back end of the house or like business wise when you go enterprise you have to start hiring like legal it procurement uh customer success sales rev ops like there's like your company starts to bloat with with a lot of hires right. when you start being to the enterprise space so yeah I, I would kind of set the foundation with plg self-serve first and then then move into enterprise when it's when it's time yes love that PJ asks, how do you deal with the code base not being shared across products? 
and with the cost building common components. Similarly, are new internal products treated the same as acquisitions where new products can have their own code base? Interesting question. Different code bases, they do operate as different products, essentially. It's almost like using two different, you know, they could be competitors for, for, for you know, when mm -hmm. it comes down to it. But that's where you have the brand to help unify and to like tell the story and the narrative for, for why they fit together as the integrations naturally unfold. What you don't want to do is break a product, like ruin the core experience of a product by forcing another product integration into it. But they move very slow. And at Hopin, like we have all these, these products, we're not moving quickly to integrate them. We want them to all be successful and stable growing businesses before we start kind of building out the suite. Our model is Intuit. Intuit's a great model because you have Mint, TurboTax, QuickBooks, and those are getting more and more integrated into the Intuit. You're like, if you log in, you see the, those other products in your account, but they own Credit Karma and they own MailChimp. And those are, are more distinct, like separate code bases. And MailChimp does have the Intuit logo on it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Credit Karma, it's, you can't find, I don't know what it is today, but at least a couple, like a month or two ago, you couldn't find Intuit on the Credit Karma website. So there's like different approaches for how you, you run a suite, like a multi-product business. Atlassian is another one, but there's going to be varying degrees and no, no like clear playbook. Basically you have to do what's right for your products and your vertical and your team, but it's definitely a, a, a challenge. But I'd say if, and when, and probably where we're going to move next is hop an ID where you have a unified login between the, the products. That's like the, the tip of the spear. Yeah. Kind of makes it easier for account sharing, unified billing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you mentioned Atlassian. Atlassian kind of has the opposite approach. Every time they launch a new, I guess, flavor of Jira, it's kind of built on that underlying Jira platform. <clears throat> and kind of for better or worse, they get a lot for, of things with that, but they also get some of the, frankly, the like cruft that comes with like all of the legacy Jira stuff as well. So it's kind of a yeah. bit of a two-edged sword. There's interesting. We did at Hopin, we had our Hopin events like Monolith legacy product that was, 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 mm -hmm. at, was used at the height of the pandemic. And then it got big, it got, you know, this robust platform and complicated. And that's not necessarily yeah. a great, a great thing. So it's like, do we launch a new product that kind of takes the best of the Hopin events platform and give and, and bring that to market? Or do we work on the Hopin events monolith and like try and take care of all, all the cruft, like you, you said. Yeah. And we did a, a 90 day sprint on that kind of alternative product. It was, it was a project that had a, a code name. And then we ended up not, not going with it just because it would have been a little bit too, too confusing the customers and overwhelming for the team. And Hopin Events has a loyal code base and it's revenue generating, highly rated. Like it's, it's still a good product. Right. Yeah. Complex question, a lot of internal, external, like a bunch of different factors playing to it. Definitely. Cool. Okay. James asks, how early is too early for a wait list? You're talking to the guy who puts out a landing page and buys mm -hmm. a domain the moment he gets the idea for, for a product. So I would say today, like yesterday for, for building, for building a wait list. It, I mean, it depends on how big of the company it is at, that, that you're at. If there's significant unity and kind of vision behind the, the initiative. Then yeah, like like start start rolling it out. Maybe make it a private or a gated wait list and roll it out to your community. Like if you have a community, that's where you could you could test it. But one of the best ways to test interest, low cost, anybody could do this, solopreneur or marketing team, is you depict the product, get some Figma designs, depict it as if it were real, and create the landing page for it. And then you have that wait list CTA. And if you want to be super targeted you could even put the price there like uh hmm. like uh what they call early bird like you buy it at a discount like it's going to cost 300 dollars, but you can buy it today for 75 dollars. and if people start buying it that's traction that's like you found like messaging and positioning that worked and customers who are interested now you just got to build the thing and that's that's a great way to go raise investment if, if i'm honest or get get resources allocated from the, from the company yeah yeah i love that but yeah, the early head of launch pricing on that. Another question from James. How do you even come up with names as you move away from the company name being synonymous with the first product? <laughs> it's a great question. I'm sure you guys have had a lot of 
discuss this to death time and time again. Yeah, James, time. thank thank you so much. This is literally I sent over a process, like a framework to the PM for Project C for how this morning for how we we should come up with the name. And he, either it's it's a messy art with little science, I'd say, in coming up with a product name, especially as more and more products come to market. And like with this kind of last the last year of, of these massive tech layoffs, you're going to have so many people. So many people were waiting for this to start building a startup, like launch a business, and even more names are going to be off the table and more domains. But anyways, um, product names, yeah, it's, there's two, two sides of the coin. One is descriptive or fanciful. You could go like more literal, like session.com. The strategy there was SEO. And we think that we can win if we, and it's going to take some time. It's a long, long tail strategy, but build up to the point where we rank for our brand term, like branded search is se if someone Google session, we have a long way to go. Um, but then on there's the other side of the coin, like StreamYard, where you have a duck and, you know, like as the icon, it's great for branding and you can win that, that branded search almost immediately. I figure have something a little more distinct and, and colorful. So it, it depends. It's, it's it really what it comes down to. This is the process in, in short and in, in just a couple of bullets is get company input, look for domains, get legal sign off, but do a little like short design sprint, take a week, five, like whittle the names down to five, 10 of the team who's, who's building, sprint on those, put it a one, one slide per idea, put in front of your exec team and then get, get buy-in, whittle it down to one, two and then polish, and then pick one. Is the .com being available a must, or at least like the a route to reasonably acquiring the .com? It depends. I think if you're going enterprise, yes, like that kind of familiarity and credibility that the .com brings is, is a high priority. But if you're doing something a little more consumer or creator or like focus, like .io, I like that one for tech. Mm -hmm. And you got like the... Yeah, I think dot, uh, dot co, I'd say, is, is probably the next popular one after dot com. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if you were to ask me if I had $100,000 and it was between $100,000 in Google ad spend or in a solid domain name, I'd pick the domain name any day. 100%. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I think we got time for one more and then we're going to let everyone go here. Blake T asks, how do you size up the opportunity of a new product? Does it need a certain size like TAM compared to your current product? TAM can be, if you Google the TAM for different industries, you'll find like widely varying numbers. And it can be a pretty unuseful or unscientifically derived number, if, if you ask me. But it does give like a general idea, but I wouldn't say it's what dictates most, like whether to go into to a market or not, because you can always move adjacently or make acquisition, like additive acquisitions to expand that TAM. So with the opportunity for a new product, look at competition. So for streamable and for session, so like pick the competitor, the bloated, expensive incumbent who you can disrupt. So for streamable, it's Vimeo, their hosting business, not the entire business, but just a, par a part of their business that we can do a lot better for session. It's Zoom large meetings and Zoom webinars. We can do it so much better than they can. That's not the whole Zoom suite. Like we don't do phones and rooms like yeah. other office products, but we're going to do a part of their business better than they do. And that's our path to capturing market share. Right. Cool. Alrighty. I think that's it. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's all we got time for today. I want to say thanks to Dave for your time. And on, honestly, thanks to everyone else for your time coming out here, sharing your questions. As a reminder, these events are put on by the Launch Awesome community. Blake's going to drop another link in the chat now. If you want to make sure you hear about future events, go ahead and join. We'd love to have you. Dave, thanks again for being here. Where can folks find you connect? How can people help you? Yeah. Email dave at hoppin.com. Twitter, mm -hmm. Dave Schools, just my full name, but with three O's in the handle. It took me like 10 minutes to find you the other day. I was like, well, I know he has a Twitter. It's just got to be so Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. Yeah, man. Thanks a bunch. And we'll see y'all. Have a good one.